Hello, everyone. I'm Francine Witt. Welcome to Flash Fiction Z. Meg Pokris and I welcome you to our brand new Flash Fiction International Reading Series. Um, the Z is, of course, for Zoom, and we're recording this so that you can enjoy this at your leisure, put your feet up. I know you guys don't get out much, so that's okay. <laughs> um, and we realize we really embrace this technology because uh, this enables us, you know, I'm here in Manhattan, Meg is in England, and so there's no way we could really um, have a flash fiction series. I mean, the commute would kill us, right? So uh, this allows us to continue this, and we're going to continue this monthly, even after the dust settles and the world goes back IRL. So um, updates on that on our Flash Fiction Z page, on our Facebook page. So tonight, we have three amazing Flash Fiction readers. Um, we have Mary Grimm, Jonathan Cardew, and Nula O'Connor. So uh, before that, Meg and I are just going to read micros to kind of warm up the airwaves in slam poetry that's known as the sacrificial lamb. So we'll start with mine. It's called Radio Stutter. Yellow morning and the bathroom mirror is clouded with doubt. Shower steam and breakup words sitting on your tongue. Later in the kitchen, you take spoony stabs at your cereal, crackle and pop and all. Your sandalwood aftershave spices the air. You splashed it on like it is raw meat marinade, like you are tendering yourself for another woman. All around us, radio stutter. You blame it on low power in an old building. You insist it's not the radio's fault. I listen for the words that are missing. All around us, flecks of us falling to the floor. Now I'd like to introduce my co-host, the lovely Meg Pokris. Meg? Thank you, Francine. I'm thrilled to be doing this. I'm thrilled to be hosting this reading series with Francine and to be hosting these three wonderful readers tonight. Um, I'll go ahead and read a, a microfiction and then we'll, go, we'll get started. Um, my microfiction is called Mood Ring. When the sun came out, I took off five layers. I felt naked and free, ready to show him the foot. It had changed again, like a mood ring, a naked foot right there in the middle of the living room. He just returned from his jog 20 miles and there was my foot. The room got still. My husband, the violinist, skinny and quick, a ferret. The room hot and sad. The sofa we'd picked because it was so cozy, we just fit. I kissed the top of his head. Ouch, he said. He used to have stacks of hair. I'm sorry about how things have turned out, I said, but he knew this already. He was sorry too, of course. He scooted away and looked out the window. His bald head was a magnet for beauty. There was a new woman on the block with a Stradivarius body, the kind he had always wanted to play. Okay, we're gonna launch into our first reader. Um, I'm gonna introduce our first reader and this will be Mary Grimm. Mary Grimm has had two books published, Left to Themselves, a novel, and Stealing Time, a story collection, both by Random House, as well as stories in a number of places, most recently, The New Yorker, South Carolina Review, and Greensboro Review. Currently, she's working on a novel set in 1930s Cleveland. She teaches fiction writing at Case Western Reserve University. Welcome, Mary. Thank you, Francine and Meg, for inviting me. Uh, I'm really pleased and flattered to be part of Flash Fiction, the, the inaugural event. Um, the first story I'm going to read is called In the Bathroom. The bathroom in the new house is leaking, is a waterfall which breaches the kitchen ceiling, green plaster falling in tectonic pieces on the stove. When she goes to the gas station, she wants to tell the mechanic her story, how she is going to take a bath at her friend's house. 
She can't help imagining the bathroom of everyone she meets, the mechanic, Fred. Is his bathroom white, pale blue, the yellow of old tile? Does it have a furry cover on the toilet, a stain in the shower that never goes away, a cracked empty glass on the windowsill? When Fred looks in the mirror, does it reflect his true face as she is afraid hers does, a face that is furious with household repair, sleepless because of the wire chewing squirrel racketing in the walls? The gas gurgles into her car and Fred watches imperturbably from the station window. At home, there is a hole in her bathroom floor where the lead pipe exposed, black and grainy, scaled with deposits of dust and water, coils away from the bathtub toward the wall. The hole is a wound sucking the life of the house, a lair where anything might live, coming out at night. Is Fred's bathroom like this? She dreams of water at night, translucent and sloshing like beer in a glass. It runs through her house, splashing from stair to stair, filling the halls, making the rooms into pools. Are there no female plumbers? Do they all poke at the pipes in a superior way? Point out how it's not done this way, hasn't been done this way for years. Fred, she wants to say, don't you have a wrench or a coiled and flexible snake? Can't we together take on the intractable nuts while dirty water drips on our heads? Search with me for tree roots, Fred, which I fear are in the drain like the roots of the tree that holds up the world, coiling, intent, writhing in the dark heat of the house. Um, this story is called The Skin of the World. On one of her bad days, Khan took to following the garbage men. She had some practical questions she would have liked to ask them. What kind of soap they used, for instance. From TV commercials of her childhood, she remembered close-ups of big brawny hands washing each other. Their wives would have to clean the sink daily. But if they lived alone, very few men would wash a sink every day, she believed. When Khan's father was alive, he had a rule that she couldn't buy a new pair of shoes until she got rid of an old pair. This was a humorous rule, but he meant it. He used to open her closet door and count her shoes, also humorously. And didn't the garbage men worry about germs? They wore gloves, of course, but the gloves themselves got very dirty. On non-garbage days, she was sedate, productive. She made bread, polished the furniture, she had begun a journal during the lawsuit at her attorney's recommendation, and she had kept it up. She communicated with her ex-boyfriend through text and email. She would say to people that she liked her boyfriend a lot before she met him, if anyone asked. The smell, she thought. They would get used to it. But what did they talk about as they made their way down the streets? Sitting and drinking coffee by herself at Starbucks, Khan brushed crumbs from the table. She wrote on a napkin, I'm on a train to nowhere. She meant to throw this away with the remains of her scone, but it ended up in her purse. She followed them only in snatches for 15 minutes or so, different trucks, one after another. She didn't want them to feel watched, pressured, stalked. She didn't want to be characterized as weird. She wrote her garbage men watching excursions in code, but about other things quite plainly. Bought new curtains at Target, Khan wrote, white with a thin stripe of yellow, and had a dream about the old house, that it was burned to the ground. The air that summer was sweet and heavy with rain, rushing across the grass. These next two stories are about mothers, the loss of them. The dream of her long dying we gave my mother away, my sister and I, bridesmaids to her dying, not knowing our duties as well as some. The plump of the pillow, smooth of the sheet, cup held to the lip, we had missed that class. She said she was dying and we said no. If this death were a dream, how then if we took her arms, one on each side of the bed? She was dressed in white, white sheets, white bandaged arm, a heroine in a white sling, bony wrist ringed in plastic. Who gives this woman? Her room was as hot as the tropics, the nurse's shirt and equatorial print, jungle, green, leafy, with the flowers brushed soft against our arms, the petals falling on her white skin and her pillow. I hoped for a parrot or a monkey to eat the bits of her unloved breakfast. Is it still snowing, she asked. 
Our answer was that we remembered the click of the soup bowl on the yellow table, the steam when she raised the lid, the stitching in the hem turned up to show our knees. She was dressed in white, and so we stepped back, one on each side of the bed. Who takes this hand? Her hair was a veil on the pillow. What we know about death. Chapter one, mother and the chocolate cake. Our cake is velvet crumbed, slivers cut one by one, each melting on the tongue, a dark communion wafer. Mother raises her head, lips plaintive with chocolate, her mouth knows a secret taste. Shall we have milk? For milk and chocolate want to mingle, to marry. Sky roofed, our pantry is by the stream, our feet careful on the rocks. The milk jug hangs by a string shimmering in the water. Our floor is leaves laid one on the other until they sink into the earth. Our cupboards nest in low branches open to wrens and robins. We do not find it strange. I have eaten all the frosting, but no one is worried. Chapter two, drying the dish towels. If the cake is gone, there is always something else, a cookie like a wheel, apple pie, edges crimped and golden, nut roll iced with a milk white glaze. Mother is not worried. She lights a candle, spindly as a twig, sets it in a cup where it burns for her birthday, one flicker of flame for each year. Time is burning here in the yellow kitchen, burning on the table in the sun. Fold the dish towels, she says. Gathered in the basket, they are flowered, curlicued, calendared, named for hotels, each one a history of stains once wiped up and removed, edges burnt by the gas flame. They fly from my hands, edges aligned, wrinkles laid fat, flat with the touch of her fingers. The yellow sun floods in and the window melts before it, the candle in its cup still burning, burning. Chapter three, aftermath. We don't believe in the exploding sky, the burrow, the hole, the tunnel below, the darkness of basements, pipes damp with decades old sweat, windows furred with dust. There we remember the sky, blue as a field of daisies in the shade of a cloud. We cover our heads with tablecloths against the fall of the ceiling. Mother's tied like a babushka, like her own mother, when she went to market, her silvering hair covered, her face framed ready to be seen. She watches the ceiling crumble, dressed in clothes that drape and flutter, her arms curved, her back bent. I offer water, an orange, a bit of bread from which I have brushed the dust. I'm fine, she says, fine, her fingers pressing mine, each word from her lips a warning. Chapter four, the jeweled fish. Moving over the gray green river, dark on either side, we sit heat pressed, heat of the sun of cooking. Mother takes my hand, our hands curve on the white cloth. The fish are honored guests. Will you eat this one scaled with silver, this with pearls, its sides encrusted like a jewel box? They twist on the platter, yearning toward the myth of water, the gray green of heaven. Mouths open, teeth aligned to bite, their eyes flatten with penance. What sin has brought them here? We have come to eat what is alive. My knees are buckling the joints as weak as river water. For as long as she can, mother holds me up. This is my apocalyptic story. When we lived in the mall, my aunt lived in the jewelry store. We ate lunch on the glass cases, admiring the gleam of diamonds while I picked the celery from my egg salad. Every afternoon we visited mom who was sewing a tent, which every woman will want when the world falls apart. The restrooms were much cleaner than you'd think, although we dreamed of hot baths. When we lived in the mall, we gave up buying things. Whenever we wanted to crisp a piece of bread, we had only to go to the toaster aisle. For entertainment, there was a wall of TVs at the electronics store, 50 screens with a game of soccer or the giant head of a man trying to sell us a set of knives. The sound system played nothing but Carly Simon, which my sister and I deplored. But my aunt felt that Carly had helped her through hard times in her life, and that even in the mall, she might need to hear, you're so vain, at any moment. My daughter did tarot readings in the old J.C. Penney's, sitting professionally behind the counter. The cards foretold the past as accurately as you might imagine. She offered a receipt, if needed, for taxes. 
My mother and my aunt thought most about the old times. They kept these memories to themselves, but we knew when they were remembering things like backyards and mailboxes. I admitted to missing the sky, but would go no further. We thought at times that an official history should be written completely with fold out maps and a CD, but no one wanted, no one wanted to do the research. My sister and I had our own place in the bookstore, for books are insulating, as everyone knows. At night, sheltered by our page-thickened walls, we read in the glow of a flashlight, our heads pillowed on paperbacks, the book roof protecting us from the pale struts and panels of the dropped and deadly ceiling. This is my existential story. Summer is only a construct. Sitting in the grass, discussing the nature of reality with an old friend while my daughter picked dandelions, crushing them against her fingers. These are yellow, she said, yellow, yellow. My friend who was not a mother blew smoke at the sky. Don't you think being outside opens you up to life, I said. Isn't that what Sartre was getting at when he wrote Being in Nothingness? I still had a brain, is what I was trying to say. The sun was hot. I don't know, my friend said. I don't read Sartre anymore. This is yellowy yellow, my daughter said. The dandelions bobbed and swayed. She rubbed them against her cheeks, and I pulled her hand away before the yellow got in her eyes. And this is my last story. Epiphany at Payless with my daughters. Waiting at the cash register to pay for the shoes, youngest was giving oldest for her birthday. How clear and blue the evening outside, the glass doors, street lights blooming in the blue air, cars and people passing by. Inside we paid our money while slender high school girls passed up and down with stacks of boxes, putting shoes back in their places, all colors that cost only $10 or 15 and could be replaced as easily as Kleenex or paper clips. I sang to my daughters in the still of the night because of how it looked outside, so blue, the blue time between day and night. The sales girl had a shiny braid, each fingernail painted a different color. I sang to my daughters of how much better to be there than anywhere in just our present state of happiness, how our place was exactly the right place. Afterward, perhaps we didn't have enough money or there was a fight over who would sit in the front seat or we went to McDonald's and the french fries were cold, things they won't remember. The feel of the car seat sliding under their legs as they fought silently, the cold lumpiness of the fries in our stomachs. But still there was the blue, the bloom of the lights, the newness of shoes in their boxes, each one saying, I am a gift of this blue evening. I am a covenant, come down out of this darkening sky. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Grimm. That was absolutely wonderful. Um, so um, our next reader is um, uh, Jonathan Cardew. And I wanted to just mention, by the way, that um, we can't hear your applause, but we know you're applauding. And so these will be posted um, on the Flash Fiction uh, Z page and we're gonna post it on Twitter and in your comments, you know, you can give your reactions and the readers can, um, you know, gratefully accept them. So that would be very nice. Um, our next reader is Jonathan Cardew. Jonathan Cardew is a writer based in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, but he is originally from Steel City, Sheffield, UK. His flash fiction appears or is forthcoming in Cream City Review, Cleaver Magazine, Superstition Review, and Craft Literary, among others. A professional finalist, his stories have been long and shortlisted at the Bath Flash Fiction Award, the Smoke Long Quarterly Award, the Wigleaf Top 50 and Passages North Neutrino Prize and the Best Small Fictions. He serves as the blog editor for Bending Genres and is the former fiction editor for Connotation Press. He enjoys long walks on short beaches 
and you can find him I suppose it's on Twitter at Cardu J Cardu. Ladies and gentlemen, Jonathan Cardu. All right, thank you so much, Francine. Hi, everyone. Hello from Milwaukee. It's a great privilege, honor to be here today. Um, I'm really uh, pleased you invited me, so thank you. Um, so I'm going to read um, three pieces to today. Thought on the theme. I want to have a theme. I like to keep things uh, nice and neat. So I'm going to keep it on a theme of escape. We all want escape right now, I'm sure. Um, so these three are different variations on the theme of escape. Okay, the first one's called In Aquarium. In Aquarium. The aquarium swallowed him whole. He was a fish out of water, in water, and he was still getting his bearings when a light shut out. Come here often, a small crab asked him from the depths. I don't know what here is, the fish said, whipping tail in a mad circle swim, hoping for some kind of escape. That's what they all say, the crab responded, clicking his claws, a kind of slow clap. Probably you were swimming with your shoal, bang, a net caught you, Bang, you went hither and thither in plastic bags. Bang, you dropped in here. That's how it usually goes. He looked at the crab. The crab's eyes were out on stalks. At least he had some company. What do I do now? The fish said. What do you do now? The small crab scratched his smooth, smooth armor-plated head with a claw. I should say you swim around in a circle, shitting where you like, eating that crap flaky dandruff they drop in, and hoping for the love of the aquarium that they change the water once in a while. That's it, said the fish. That's it. The crab released bubbles from its slat mouth. The fish swam with the bubbles to the top of the tank where the water rippled and rose gently in its usual way. This isn't so bad, thought the fish. I can get used to this. He scooped up a flake or two and swallowed. He shot shit pellets out into the dark. As he looked up, he thought he could make out two huge watery eyes staring down at him. What did that crab say again? He thought to himself. All right, that's one. My second one, I used to go uh, camping in France um, as a kid, <clears throat> and I'd love to go back there. Um, so this is my vehicle for escape back to France. And this one's called The Mime Artist is a Little Drunk, but that's okay. The Mime Artist slides her white gloved hands over an invisible wall. It's seriously slippery, and she can't get a grip. Her husband says, you need to get a grip. She knows what he means. For the children, he says. Oh God, the children. For me. She investigates an invisible tree, strokes her fingers over its branches. At the end of one, she plucks an apple and holds it up to the light. Don't, he says. She widens her eyes, makes moons. When in doubt, this is what she resorts to. I'm going to France, she says, studying the apple, turning it. St. Marlowe. She crunches in, making no sound. Professionally, I need to. Brittany ferries and a litany of texts, the water washing up against the portholes. Is there somebody else? The grey slit of the horizon. Do I know him? A shoreline approaching. Do I know you? La France, shouts the mime artist silently. And more quietly, La France. A small boy notices her scanning the port. France is huge, 
says the boy, demonstrating with his arms, spreading them wide, this big. The mime artist wags her finger, shakes her head. She places her thumb and forefinger together, squeezes tight. Tiny, she whispers through perfectly red lips. The bed sit is as expected, enough for one person to get drunk in. A yellowed fly curtain, a dubious stain on the wall, an Armenian couple next door shouting. She lip synchronizes and makes exaggerated hand movements, predicts the lengths of the Armenian's pauses. Later, she brushes her teeth in the mirror with a non-existent toothbrush, flosses without floss, smiles without feeling. In bed, with her knees up to her chest, she dials an invisible rotary phone and drinks real cognac, getting into the conversation. The next day, a small crowd gathers around the mime artist. She has set up her brown leather suitcase in front of a small crepery. She pulls out a ladder, a very long one, one she can hardly keep upright because of its unwieldiness. The ladder is invisible, but somehow the mime artist manages to land her feet on the rungs and she begins climbing the ladder straight up into the air. The crowd gasps and for a minute, the mime artist feels that familiar rush. In the act of mimicry, she is who she is. She is whole and unencumbered. She could carry on climbing, defying gravity, filling people with joy. It could go on. She misjudges one rung and falls. I have some loose ends to tie up, says the mime artist over the phone. Static now on the other end. How do you mime static, she thinks. By loose ends, she means more drinking. By loose ends, she means once you start pulling, you don't know where the thread's going to go. I'll be back by October. She walks the city's walls, the ancient ones buttressing the old town, keeping the tall slate houses tight and locked in. The English Channel masses in the distance, layered gray and uninviting. The bottle she carries is real. Each sip she takes is real. Her heart beating invisib invisibly in her chest is real, but she knows that nothing is really real until you have mimed it. She puts down the bottle, puts down her hat, waits for the crowd. Okay, that's two. I can hear the applause. Um, <clears throat> okay, this last one again is um, themed around escape. And this one is escape into technology, which we are all doing and have been doing all this time. Okay, this one's called pretend phoning. Suddenly, it became clear to Antoine why he did it. He was not lacking friendship or love or incoming phone calls. He got plenty of those. It was pure physical need. He was hungry for the phone to be by his ear. If it was not by his ear, if he was not talking into it or nodding in response to the questions or statements of the caller, or making plans to meet at certain times of certain days, he felt bereft. He felt somewhat not himself. So he pretend phoned. He would lift the phone from his pants pocket and answer with a simple, hello? He learned to pause and to interject at appropriately spaced moments. He learned through observation that some calls were simply monologues and the receiver would just stare into middle space while the speaker in the earpiece spouted their pearls of wisdom. He got so good at it, he forgot occasionally to take the phone from his ear and he would walk into stores or his job with the phone still there, slick with sweat. His girlfriend once asked him who he was talking to and he froze. Who was he talking to? He desperately scanned faces in his mind, but the situation a romantic dinner, scuppered any clear thought. So he stammered, a co-worker, which understandably aroused her suspicions. He had been on the phone a lot lately. 
she let her fork fall on the plate in the restaurant. After that incident, Ansoir was careful to conduct his pretend phoning in private, in toilet cubicles, for instance. With his pants around his ankles, he would place the phone to his ear. There was no noise, save for the occasional crackle caused by his perforated eardrums. He was angrier now on the phone line, heated in his responses, sometimes shouting, I don't know what you mean by that. What are you trying to say to me? Or, I'm not going to be able to make it. New York's too far, too fucking full of people. But most of all, his responses were mundane, just simple statements of fact, arranging meeting times and things of that nature. Three o'clock, absolutely. Three o'clock will work. Bye. The pretend phoning was beginning to feel like the sanest thing Ansoir could do. The only thing, really. Okay, thanks everyone for listening. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Jonathan. That was wonderful. Our final reader tonight is Nula O'Connor. Nula O'Connor lives in County Galway, Ireland. In 2019, she won the James Joyce Quarterly Competition to write the missing story for Dubliner's Ulysses. Her fourth novel, Becoming Belle, was recently published to critical acclaim in the United States, Ireland, and the UK. Her forthcoming novel is about Nora Barnacle, wife and muse to James Joyce. Nula is the editor of the wonderful Flash Ezine Zonk. I'm sorry, Splunk. <laughs> sorry. I've got Zoom on my mind. Splunk. Welcome, Nula. Thanks so much, Meg. Thanks a million for having me. Uh, delighted to be here on the first uh, Z reading. Uh, the first one I'm going to read is from this uh, tiny little flash chapbook that came out in 2013. Uh, it's as rare as hen's teeth at this point. Um, and this is called Fish. When you have seen your neighbour in the raw and he has seen you seeing him, it cannot be undone. You looked from your box room window down into Nicholas's garden, but you didn't expect to see him standing on his puddled clothes, all chest fuzz and stomach and genitals. He stood looking down at his shirt, jeans and boxers. Then he lifted his eyes straight up to yours. Fuck. He swiped his hands together, looking at his palms and picked at them, pulling off fish scales, you guessed. Half an hour earlier, you had driven out of your estate, down the road, past the shops and onto the roundabout. There you saw Nicholas's lorry on its side, spilling a sea of fish onto the tarmac. The fish were grey and dull-eyed and the road was completely blocked. Nicholas stood there among them like a man from the Bible with his hands outstretched. Some motorists were out of their cars, hanging around, watching. A taxi driver shouted at Nicholas, what the fuck? Then he got back into his cab and sulked. Nicholas threw himself onto the pile of fish and wailed. Then he got up and walked away. You followed him in your car, off the roundabout, past the shops, up the road and into your estate. Nicholas opened his front door and slammed it hard behind him. Slipping up your own stairs, you went into the box room and looked down into his garden. He had already stripped and you were full frame in the window, his head lifted and you couldn't move. You saw his naked body and what 53 years had made of it. And he saw you seeing him. So you slipped your dress over your head, unhooked your bra and wiggled out of your knickers. And then Nicholas saw what 47 years had made of you, your skin, breasts and belly. And none of it could be undone. So you both smiled. That's my first story. Um, the second one I'm going to read is from Mother America, which was published by New Island, I think in 2012. Um, I find when I'm publishing short story collections, there's a sort of a resistance from the editors to flash fiction. They're not that keen, but I do always manage to stick a few in. Um, this is a historical, Flash, um, inspired by the book, The Women of Galway Jail. And I read about one of the women had been jailed for trapping hares on the river. 
which seems like a terrible thing to go to prison for. Uh, it's called Moongazer. Up they come from the river Carib like wild arrows, thurump, thurump, thurump. I can feel their gut and sinew deep in my breast as they bolt past. They settle then in their shallow beds and I stay as still as granite, except for hitching my shawl this way or that for comfort. The sky is mackerel and buttermilk, I have to wait. I pass the time by remembering the island and its clear air. It never stank like this town. And I think of my husband swallowed up by the sea so many years ago, his young body bloated and salty when I got him back. We were two months wed. We hadn't even made a child. Dusk closes down over the riverbank by and by. The moon, I see, will be a poor lamp tonight. It is just a pairing. I take a snare from my sack and set to work. I tie it to the sturdiest branch I can find and secure it with two twigs. I sweep my hand underneath to check it is not too low, not too high. Then I go back to my perch by the river and wait. My bonnet string itches my chin, so I tease it with one finger. The grumble from my belly grows loud. I wonder if the hairs will cuddle down and not bother to come at all, but they do. One by one, I hear them lollop about. They stop, testing the air with their noses. One of them, a doe, is a moon gazer, and she sits on her haunches and turns her face to where the slice of moon rests. Then on she goes. She is my lady. I follow her down the narrow run where I set the snare, and sure enough, she's snagged there. The doe lurches forward and gets bogged deeper into the wire hoop. Go easy, girl, I say, rubbing the plush length of her. You're a fine lassie. I grab her ears and flip her. I slice her pale belly in one quick move. Out plops a sack of leverets and I gasp. I look closer, three little ones in all. You were luckier than I, I say. Tossing the babies into the long grass, I take their mother to the river to gut and wash her. It takes a while to find the cinders from my last fire, but soon I'm heating the doe's carcass over them, over the flames. The smell of cooking makes me weak and I pluck strings of pink meat and gobble them back. Looking into the fire, I think again of Shawnee and the hours we spent wrapped around each other in the settled bed every night of our marriage and the turf glowing in the grate. I curse God for not letting a baby take inside me, for not leaving me something of my man to hold on to. If only I had a son to mind me, I wouldn't have to scratch around on the banks of the Carib, killing young mothers to fill my gut. I raise my face to the crescent moon and beg her to forgive me. So that's the second story. Um, the third story I want to share with you is from my last short story collection called Joyride to Jupiter, which was also published by New Island. Again, I actually had a different editor, but this editor, lovely as he was, also wasn't a huge fan of flash fiction, but I managed to squash five flash into the collection. Um, I really have to probably make moves towards bringing out a full length collection of flash. Uh, this story is called Yellow, and um, even though at the time I wasn't thinking about it, I now see it as a transgender story. Uh, you'll notice a theme of motherhood and infertility and uh, pregnancy loss in, in these stories, and not all of my flash are about that, but somehow when I was picking these today, that's what emerged. Yellow. At the entrance, a woman hands each of us a net. When I imagined this moment, I saw us being given a single net. We would move as one, four hands on the handle, catching our baby together. Twice the chance Rob hisses, snapping the net like a riding crop. Yes, I think yes. Double the opportunity, 100% better. Yes, yes. We run side by side down the corridor with all the other hopefuls into the dome. I see babies high in the roof space, they helicopter and dive. The air smells of lotion and scalp. 
a pink with seraphic thighs, flies towards me, and I shove past a man and try to net her. She dodges upwards and skims sideways. I jump high, knocking against the man again, but I miss. Get fucked at the man screams at me and chases the pink, arcing his net wildly, but it meets empty air. Up ahead, I see Rob dip his net under a drifting blue. Stop, I shout, waving my arms. We had agreed pink and the rules are clear. <coughs> Excuse me. One baby per couple. If Rob snags a blue, it's over. What the hell are you at? I scream. Rob steps back from the blue and holds his palms out in surrender. Pink, I snarl. Then I see it, executing a cocky glissade above all the pinks and blues, a yellow. Its face is turtleish, but it looks strong. It seems unconcerned as it streels across the dome, surveying the waggle of a hundred nets and the anxiety of the would-be parents below. I catch the yellow's eye and it holds my gaze. Come to me, I whisper. Keeping watch on its robust body, I see it gravitate towards me. The yellow's eyes are clear and bright. It stares at me as if in recognition. I lift my net, then let it fall to the floor. I open my arms and the yellow descends, poised as a hawk. The baby's weight is so welcome and strange and I am becalmed. The tiny parcel of unruly limbs settles and I hold it close. The baby snuggles its head to my breast and Rob is suddenly at my side, placing his hand respectfully on the little one's beautiful head. We look at each other and smile. We look at the baby, our golden child are yellow. So that's that one. Uh, <coughs> I think I'll read um, it's one actually that Jonathan published in Connotation Press a, a few years ago, maybe three years ago now. Uh, it's called Touch. And um, it's not autobiographical. <laughs> Touch. The night porter at the Holiday Hotel had a false hand. It was slender and rubbery like the hand of a large doll. My friend Donna and I worked in the hotel as chambermaids the last summer of school. We called it the ho-ho, a word that tickled us every time we said it. Steve was the night porter's name and he was a quiet fellow. No one knew much about him. He whistled to himself all the time, and I liked the tinny, mournful sound he made. Though Donna and I had money, it was the summer of our shoplifting spree. We took jewellery, nail varnish, brass, anything that could be swiftly pocketed. That summer we stole and we made beds and we talked about Steve, because Donna was determined to give him her cherry. I just don't know about that fucking hand, she say as if that was going to be the obstacle to their union. I wonder, does he pull himself with it? And she would mime the action, keeping her own hand straight and her face rigid. I laughed, conscious stricken, but entertained. I didn't tell Donna that I too wanted to touch Steve and be touched by him. And that it was mostly because of his hand. I'd stolen a signet ring for him with an S curlicued onto the bezel. I wore it to bed each night and twirled it round my finger, thinking about the moment I would gift it to him, about how heart touched he would be, and what I would say, hold me, and what he would say, you're beautiful. One hungover Saturday, Donna didn't turn up for our early shift at the hotel. Steve unlocked the reception door to me, and before he could move off, I grabbed his false hand. He let a low groan and looked away, but he didn't stop me when I lifted the rubber fingers to my lips and kissed from pinky to palm. He took back his hand, lunged in and kissed me, an awful churning of his big tongue in my mouth. But I thought, this is it now, this is the real thing. Steve led me with his good hand along the corridor, the clangor of his keys, the only noise in the hush of the hotel. He unlocked the storeroom and lifted me to sit on a shelf along with squadrons of Vim and Luro. His hands were on my thighs, the rubber one, a cold weight, and he breathed heavily into my face. 
I plucked the signet ring from my pocket and held it out for Steve to see. The little thief, he said. He took the ring and kissed me again, forcing his mouth so hard around mine that it felt as if he wanted to swallow me. When the kiss was over, I opened my eyes. Steve stepped back from me and smirked, tossed the ring to the floor and backed away. He flicked off the light switch, went out the door and shut it. I heard the click of the lock and the jingle of his keys as he moved off. I heard him whistle. That's it. Thanks very much for listening. Thank you so much, Nula. That was absolutely wonderful. You all were amazing. And what a great first reading this, this was. Thank you so much for being here. And I thought I'd leave everyone tonight with a prompt and a creative challenge. And the idea is to write a story um, from this challenge and to send it to us at our email address, which is flashfictionzreadings at gmail.com. And we'll post the address on our Facebook page as well. So that might be a fun thing for people to do is to see if you can come up with a story. And then Francine and I will read through them and we'll select our favorite and the winner then can read with us next time, next month. So here is my uh, little prompt challenge for you all. So the idea is to write a story incorporating at least three things or concepts from the COVID-19 days that we're all living through right now, but not to write a story about the pandemic. So let's say you use um, words like mask, sanitizer, quarantine, and write a story that has absolutely nothing to do with what we're living through. So what a creative, creative challenge that will be. Um, and um, I wanted to thank you all for, for watching and for tuning in. And thank you so much again to our readers. Thanks, Francine, for hosting this with me. And we're going to be doing this again next month. Keep, um, keep apprised of our Facebook page to see what, who's going to be reading with us next. So thank you guys and take care, everybody. Take care out there. Scary times. Okay. Bye. Good night. Bye. Bye.